Welcome to the second installment of our conversation about the Cheltenham School District budget. I'm Dr. Wagner Marseille, Superintendent. Today, we want to walk you through a look at how the district prepares its budget, share with you some of our recent achievements and current and future challenges, and how we are going to address those moving forward. As many of you know and have experienced that the district has gone through a significant amount of shifts in its demographic population. And with that shift comes uh, some opportunities and also some, some challenges. So if you take a look at our student enrollment uh, since 1990 to 2018, we've seen a significant shift in the population of white students and uh, African-American or black students, uh, where now we moved from 30% African-American many years ago to now 53% of the population of Cheltenham students uh, are African-American and or black. And a 76% back in 1990 for white students to now 30%. In addition to some of those shifts, we are seeing some other demographics that are shifting that do play a factor in the budget process, uh, the allocation uh, to support uh, particular programs or particular students. So we are experiencing a spike in our special education uh, enrollment. Uh, and with that, we'll talk a little bit more later about what some of those challenges are, but also what are the financial challenges that come with providing the supports that students need. We are seeing a significant increase from students who are free and reduced lunch. We also seeing a larger number of students in need that are in foster care and uh, an increase in the number of homeless students. We say that only to share with you that each of those demographic shifts come with a certain set of experiences that the district in its planning process or its budget planning process needs to take into account. So for us as a growing district with respects to diversity, we know that we can't move forward without making sure that we provide access and opportunity for the less privileged students uh, in our community. And some of those students fit a particular demographic profile. So equity and excellence, according to Boyer, cannot be divided. So in 2016, the district launched its new strategic plan, Five Pathways, One Destination. Uh, in that plan, the district laid out some core goals through 2021 and wanted to make sure that we address all the needs of the students that are in our, uh, in our community. So I wanna share with you some of the highlights that uh, we're extremely proud of in year two of the strategic plan. And obviously these are just seminal um, highlights. We could have a conversation or another PowerPoint that could detail in length uh, what the specifics are, but I wanted to share with you some of our pathways and some of the things that we, we are seeing. So with pathway one around curriculum instruction, we've been really deliberate in thinking about how do we create a K through 12 aligned curriculum that establishes new instructional methodologies, new ways of engaging students, new opportunities for not only um, uh, students who are struggling, but also opportunities for students who are excelling. Uh, so we've uh, implemented some, some courses such as AP Computer Science, uh, Robotics, Engineering, and Design, and the way in which we look at project-based learning in our 7th, 9th, and 10th grade uh, programs. I also want to share with you Pathway 2 Student Achievement, where we moved away from an archaic way of looking at ability and move towards the Nagliari nonverbal ability. Our focus on professional learning is important as we have dedicated a significant amount of district dollars to supporting our staff in around innovation and their instructional practices and providing staff with the resources they need 
to provide intervention for our, our students and enrichment. Holistic supports as we think about climate and culture um, with the work that we're doing with positive behavior intervention and support systems and the training that's happening there. Our mindfulness website that if you have not had an opportunity, we encourage you to, uh, to go there. We're also launching new and exciting ways to better communicate and engage with our, our stakeholders. So we're excited about those opportunities as well. One of the other big conversations that we're having across the district um, as we take pride in our diversity is the conversation around cultural uh, proficiency and moving from cultural destructiveness to cultural proficiency lens. There's a number of books that we have used to help guide our conversations with staff, with families, with our students. Uh, Glenn Singleton stands out. Uh, his book on courageous conversations about race continues to be a hallmark for us as we continue this work. I also want to share with you a brief video about an exciting project-based learning uh, initiative, which oftentimes I think about initiatives as one and done, but this really is about uh, at the heart of the way in which we want to lead uh, teaching and learning throughout uh, the district. Uh, my name is Wagner Marseille, the proud superintendent of uh, Cheltenham uh, School District. Two years ago when we went to High Tech High to explore this concept, we knew after spending three days in San Diego and experiencing what those students experienced with the teachers there, that there was no way we can come back to Cheltenham and just continue to do the same old thing. I joined PBL because I always was good at building projects, so I thought PBL would be a good experience and better for me than a normal classroom setting. It gives each student a voice and choice in what they're learning and gives them the ability to gain skills and, and techniques that they can utilize in their everyday lives. Seeing the responsibility shift from teacher center to student center, but students really starting to own it, that has been the most rewarding thing. I don't think there's anything better you can do for a student. The new Cedarbrook, the 180,000 square foot 21st century learning experience that uh, provides flexible spacing and flexible learning opportunities at the heart of inquiry and design thinking. It is a welcoming home uh, and it's more than just about the physical structure, it's about being able to make those connections again with, uh, with, with friends. When we started the project we talked about several things and one of the things that we talked about the most is that all spaces should be flexible and all spaces should be transparent so that anyone walking through the building should be able to see the learning that happens in every space. You have the philosophy of our delivery of practice and then you have a building that matches that. Everything in every classroom is suitable to kids with all learning styles, and that was the goal in outfitting the rooms. Each time I walk into a different section or a different room, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. From the beginning, uh, we were looking at uh, open design, that uh, it would be, uh, all the classroom would be bright, functioning for our, uh, for our students. The Learning Commons, which is the hub of the whole building, is, is just magnificent. When you look at the main gym, it, it, it's just, there's no other word other than awesome. I think the design fits seamlessly to uh, the direction which we want to go to instructionally. So it is a sense of bringing family back. It's, um, it's been a long time coming. We've also been really intentional uh, with mindfulness and how to utilize uh, and think about empathy, resilience, and grit, and programs that we have embedded during the school day and after school, um, supported by Dr. Horsey's office, our uh, director of student services, led by our positive psychology coach, Cindy Goldberg. We also want to talk about some of the great work we're doing around the arts,
We continue to be amazed at our outstanding student athlete uh, accomplishments. Our faculty joins in that as well. At this time, please welcome District Business Manager, Ms. Kara Michaels, who will walk you through our funding process and the way in which we collaborate on preparing the budget. Thank you, Dr. Marseille. During the second half of this presentation, I will walk you through the budget process, review some of our budget challenges, and provide insight on our current fiscal realities. To help you fully understand some of the terminology that will be used moving forward, you can find a glossary at the end of this presentation. Let's start with the budget process. The Pennsylvania Department of Education has established a template and timeline for all PA public schools to follow. As you will see, PDE's budget timeline is approximately 10 months, beginning in September with the publication of the Act 1 index through June with the adoption of the final budget. There are key benchmarks throughout the process which requires the school board to take action. The first is authorizing a proposed preliminary budget or the authorization of the opt-out resolution. This is all centered on the Act 1 index, which I will review on the next slide. The preliminary budget process allows the district to explore the possibility of raising school taxes above the established Act 1 index. This is known as filing for referendum exceptions. The opt-out resolution establishes that the school board will not raise taxes above the Act 1 index. Over the past five years, Sheltonham School Board has authorized the adoption of the opt-out resolution. Based upon PDE's timeline, the only remaining benchmark left after the authorization of the opt-out resolution is the adoption of the proposed final budget in May and the adoption of the final budget in June. The Act 1 Index In 2006, legislation was created that established a maximum percent a district can levy for school real estate taxes without requiring a voter referendum. This percent is referred to as the Act 1 Index. The Act 1 index is determined by averaging the percent increase in Pennsylvania statewide weekly wage and the Federal Employment Cost Index for elementary and secondary schools. Now, there are some scenarios in which districts can raise taxes above the Act 1 index without voter referendum. The first is by going through the preliminary budget process and applying to PDE for referendum exceptions. There are three categories of referendum exceptions, school construction, retirement, and special education. Each category has a special calculation based on the individual district's data. That determines the additional amount a district can raise above index. Again, this must be approved by PDE. The second is for districts with a market value personal income aid ratio or MVPI greater than 0.4. This ratio represents the relative wealth in relation to the state average for each pupil in a district. It basically measures the wealth of a district. If a district has an MVPI aid ratio that is greater than 0.4, the value of their index is adjusted upward by multiplying the Act 1 index by the sum of 0.75 and their aid ratio. This is known as the adjusted Act 1 index. This is important for Sheltonham because Sheltonham's aid ratio is 0 0.4003, and for the 2019-20 budget year, our Act 1 index rate was adjusted. This slide provides a historical overview of the Act 1 index, MPVI aid ratio, and Sheltonham's actual tax increases. As you can see during the school years of 2006 and 7 through 2010 and 11, Sheltonham was approved for referendum exceptions. Over the next 8 out of 9 years, Sheltonham was at or below the Act 1 index. Now that you have a general understanding of the budget process, let's talk about where Sheltonham's funding comes from. Funding is divided into four major categories, local, state, federal, and fund balance. Sheltonham is not unique to any other public school in that the majority of funding comes from the local effort, specifically real estate taxes. Currently, 77% of Sheltonham's budget is funded by local revenue. Since real estate tax revenue is a major component of local funding, I wanted to touch upon some areas that could positively or negatively impact it. 
First is the overall assessment value of real estate within the township. As assessment values of properties increase or decrease, tax revenue is impacted in the same manner. Next is millage rate, which is the tax rate levied per $1,000 of property value that is used to calculate local property taxes. As millage rates increase or decrease, tax revenue is impacted in the same manner. The value of a mill, or one thousandth of a dollar, is the amount that establishes additional tax revenue that can be generated by raising the millage rate. This is impacted by assessment value and the collection rate. Finally, the collection rate is pretty self-explanatory. It is the percentage of real estate taxes collected in a fiscal year. Again, these are all key factors in determining real estate tax revenue funding. On the next few slides, you will see the challenges Sheltonham faces with these key areas. Sheltonham continues to face challenges that impacts its revenue budget. The township is primarily residential, which means homeowners are contributing the majority of tax revenue. In other Montgomery County districts, such as Abington and Upper Marion, the tax base is concentrated more on commercial. Therefore, businesses are contributing at a higher share of tax revenue. Sheltonham's overall assessment value has decreased approximately 1% in the past five years. While this continues to be a challenge, recent assessment trends are noticing a slight upswing in our township. You will see that on the next slide, while Sheldonham has not recovered back to the assessment value from the 2013-14 fiscal year, it has experienced a positive increase since the low point in the 2016-17 fiscal year. As it is connected to the overall assessment, Sheldonham's value of a mill has also decreased over the last five years. While collection rates have been steady at above 94%, the fluctuation in assessed value has made an impact. On a positive note, as assessment values rise, the value of a mill will also rise. Finally, a major challenge in the revenue budget is that Sheltonham currently has the highest millage rate in Montgomery County. This slide provides an illustration of Sheltonham's overall assessment since the 2013-14 fiscal year. As I mentioned, there has been a positive upswing since the 2016-17 fiscal year. This provides a snapshot of how Sheltonham's value of a mill compares to other Montgomery County districts. Currently, if Sheltonham raises taxes by one mill, it generates approximately $1.8 million in additional tax revenue, as opposed to Hatboro Horsham, who would generate $2.5 million, and as opposed to Lower Marion, who would generate $7.7 million. Next, I would like to touch upon expenditures that drive budget development. The biggest area in any school district budget is salaries and benefits, which can be no surprise due to the service nature of the industry. Sheltonham is no different in that approximately 71% of the district's budget is allocated towards salaries and benefits. The other major areas of debt service, student services, and operations comprise 23.8% of the remaining 29% of the budget. As with revenue budget development, Sheltonham faces some challenges in expenditures. The most impactful challenge is that expenditure growth is outpacing revenue growth. Starting this year, administration is working very diligently to level this off so that expenditures match revenue growth. Other major areas that impact budget development are the rising special education and transportation costs, debt service, salaries, and benefits. As state and federal funding remains flatlined and there is limited or no growth in overall assessment and major expenditures continue to rise, Sheltonham faces operating at an annual deficit. At fiscal year end 2018, expenditures exceeded revenues by approximately $3 million. This shortfall was made up through fund balance. If no changes are made to reduce expenditures, Sheltonham will continue to operate at a deficit and continue to decrease fund balance. Special education is an area in which all school districts in the country are seeing a rise in overall expenditures. Federal and state mandates, which are not fully funded, continue to place financial hardships on districts. Since the 2011-12 school year, Sheltonham's special education population has increased by 30 percent, or 190 students. While state and federal special education funding has remained flatlined over that time period, Local funding efforts have increased approximately 50% or $2.4 million. Sheltonham transportation expenditures is another area that continues to rise. 
Since 2012-13, Sheltenham transportation costs have increased approximately 64% or $3.4 million. While Sheltenham Township is only comprised of 9.06 square miles, its landscape provides a number of challenges to ensure safe conditions for student transportation. The township has a large number of identified hazardous routes and lacks the walkability found in some other districts, which enables safe walking routes and reduces the need for transportation. Currently, Sheltonham buses 4,000 of its currently enrolled 4,500 students. The district also transports 650 of non-public students. On a positive note, Sheltonham's current five-year contract, which went into effect this fiscal year, will realize a substantial reduction in its daily transportation rate. This is an example of how Sheltonham administrators are working towards the goal of expenditures meeting revenue growth. A non-financial highlight of the current transportation contract is that 40 72 passenger propane fuel buses were added to the existing Sheltonham transportation fleet. The implementation of propane fuel buses supports the district and community efforts to protect the environment through green initiatives. Since 2009, Sheltonham has rebuilt Sheltonham Elementary, Glenside Elementary, Wincote Elementary, and Cedarbrook Middle School. It has also renovated Myers Elementary, portions of the high school, and the modular buildings. Addressing the deteriorating facilities did not come without a cost. Since the 2009-2010 fiscal year, Sheltonham's annual debt service expenditures have increased by $5 million or 50%. With a current principal debt service balance of over $160 million, Sheltonham's annual debt service payment is $10 million. Over the past several years, administration in conjunction with the district's financial advisors have been able to implement a refinancing plan, which enabled a savings of over $3 million. These savings are required by law to be distributed over the term of the bonds. However, it has enabled Sheltonham to stabilize its annual debt service at $10 million. In the midst of the increased debt service and overall budget deficit, Sheltonham was able to maintain its AA- minus bond rating. However, a continued decrease in fund balance without stabilization of expenditures will have a negative impact on the rating. As we near towards the end of the presentation, I would like to focus on the areas that have the largest impact on the budget, salaries and benefits. Sheltonham's overall salaries are currently above $50 million and are highly competitive with our Montgomery County peers. While this slide only provides a snapshot of salary ranges for each employee classification, you can review Sheltonham's employment contracts at the link provided. If you have any issues accessing this link, please visit the district's website and select the school board tab. The last link on that page will allow you to access the employment contracts. Sheltonham's overall benefits are currently above $30 million. Many of the benefits afforded to the staff are directly impacted by salaries. As salaries increase, the benefits increase. The primary benefit that impacts the budget is the Pennsylvania State Employee Retirement System, or PSERS. It is an agency of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that administers the pension plan for Pennsylvania public school employees. It is classified as a 401A governmental defined benefit plan. This means that the retirement benefit is determined by a formula which includes a retirement factor, years of credited service, and the final average salary. It is funded by school district based upon an annual rate certified by the PSERS board. The current rate is 33.43%. Here is an example which will help to paint a clearer picture on the impact of PSERS. If an employee makes $100,000, the district must contribute $33,430 into that individual's retirement. With a current payroll of over $50 million, Sheltonham is required to contribute over $16.7 million towards retirement. As illustrated on this chart, since the 2008-09 school year, the required employer contribution for PSERS has increased from 4.76 to 33.43%. As you will see, this amount is projected to continue to increase. While the district is required to submit payment for 100% of the retirement expenditures, PDE does provide a subsidy to districts for 50% of the cost. While this does assist to offset with the retirement expenditures, the state is experiencing its own budget issues, which is also impacted by the ongoing rise in PSERS expenditures. 
The main reason the employer contribution rate has risen so dramatically is that the retirement fund as of June 30th, 2018 was carrying an unfunded liability in the amount of $44.5 billion. While legislation was enacted to restructure the retirement plan for incoming employees as of July 1, 2019, districts will still be required to contribute the certified rate for all employees. The new legislation greatly reduces the district's liability for new employees. However, the additional contribution will be used to address the unfunded liability. Therefore, the reduction of contributions for employers will not be immediately realized. In conclusion to my segment of this presentation, I want to reemphasize the commitment of fiscal responsibility of Sheltonham School Board and Administrative Team. Over the past five years, tax increases have been below or at the Act 1 index. This has been accomplished through the commitment of use of fund balance. Also, ongoing cost saving initiatives such as refinancing of debt, energy efficiency, and a new transportation contract have assisted in reducing overall expenditures. While all of these measures have been implemented, there is still a lot more work to do. The proposed 2019-20 budget currently calls for a tax increase to the adjusted Act 1 index of 2.6%, while still showing an overall deficit of almost $4 million. Administration is diligently working to reduce the 2019-20 budget gap through continued reduction of overall expenditures. The proposed final budget will be reviewed and discussed at the next Financial Affairs Committee meeting on May 4, 2019. The final budget will be reviewed and discussed at the June 2, 2019 meeting. These meetings are public and everyone is encouraged to attend. On behalf of Dr. Marseille, I would like to thank you for taking the time to learn more about all of the great things happening in the district and exploring the budget process.